Live from Boston, my name is Emilia Madrigal, and today is December 22, 2020. I'm joined remotely by my good friend and colleague, Rifat Manan, who is in the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Today is the, we're going to be streaming our last lecture of 2020, and I am delighted to welcome one of my Mass General Brigham colleagues, Dr. Bradley Quady, who is the Chief of Perinatal Pathology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and an Associate Professor of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Quady will be presenting an OB PATH lecture titled Motor Pregnancy and Gestational Trophoblastic Disease. As always, please feel free to post comments and questions and we'll make sure to pass those along at the end of the lecture. So with that introduction, I'll turn the microphone over to Dr. Quady. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, first, uh, let me, uh, as, as, as he said, uh, we're in Boston. And as you, some of you may know, we had a pretty heavy snowstorm not too long ago. And yesterday was this, the winter solstice. And we only we had a few minutes over nine hours of of sunlight, so that means uh, being the the day after the solstice, you had to get up very early to to attend this, which I, I deeply appreciate. Um, so I I have a um, let me just kind of outline my goals um, for. Uh, this session, mostly I'm going to talk about molar pregnancy uh, and just and the concept of what's called gestational trophoblastic disease. Um, I'm going to start by highlighting molar gestations in their pathobiological context, some of their molecular biology, uh, their clinical context, their, their cell biology and developmental biology. Uh, and then we'll focus on defining the histologic and genetic genetic features that, that you can use to distinguish molar gestations from each other and their mimics. And hopefully you won't be too frustrated at that point and that, that I'll try to give you, uh, and if you are, I'll, I, I wanna end that part by giving you a, a practical strategies for, for pathologic diagnosis that, that will leverage whatever available ancillary tools that you have. And then uh, I, with Carlos uh, Haran's permission, I, I asked if I could share some breaking news on the COVID-19 and uh, on the topic of COVID-19 and pregnancy to review some of the recent findings um, of what uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in the placenta looks like and what some of the clinical implications are and to, to define some of the emerging features of COVID-2 placentitis. Okay, oops. So a, a few key concepts about molar pregnancy before we get, get too far into it. First of all, molar pregnancies are products of conception. Uh, and that being the case, they're genetically distinct from the host in which they reside. Uh, and they arise most frequently frequently from genetic errors occurring during fertilization. Uh, and pretty much all of the things that we're gonna talk about today, you can, you can point back to some reasonable mechanism that occurred during um, the genetics of, of fertilization um, by the paternal and, and maternal haploid genomes. These uh, proliferations then uh, are, trophoblastic in nature and like normal trophoblasts, they have a propensity to invade tissue and blood vessels. But our, our uh, classification really um, is based uh, at, at first pass on whether there's presence or an absence of chorionic villi. And then from there, uh, their phenotypic classification um, depends on what, what normal trophoblast cell they uh, resemble, um, and when and, and hopefully at the end you'll be able to understand where these proliferations sit within the the spectrum of trophoblastic neoplasia. And in the end, I think we must consider them as as neoplastic proliferations. 
Okay, w one way to think about these uh, triple elastic proliferations is to think about them in terms of the differentiation of tropoblasts and how that correlates with the neoplast ne neoplastic counterparts. Um, so tropoblasts start off as uh, in, sort of in the heme path, path world, the, there's a differentiation pathway of tropoblasts. They start off as pre-villous tropoblasts, which first differentiate into villous uh, cytotropoblasts. Uh, and then um, those differentiate into uh, a transitional type of extravillous trophoblast, some in the columns, some on the surface of the trophoblast, the in situ trophoblast. And those in the column then um, develop into um, the trophoblastic columns that anchor the placenta and develop into um, extra villous trophoblasts either in the implantation site or in the placental membranes. Uh, one important um, commonality of all of them is all trophoblasts are GATA3 positive. And in the right context, that's our most powerful uh, immunophenic uh, histochemical tool to, to identify trophoblastic neoplasms. Uh, and then from there, we can use their phenotypic similarity. For example, some are Melcam positive in the trophoblast columns and in, in the implantation site, whereas others are P63 positive, for example. So these markers in the proper context help us uh, distinguish which kind of uh, tumors we're looking at. Another way to think about uh, the categorization of these tumors is a more, a more cell biological um, tumor. And as I said, the, the, for to, today's talk, we're gonna focus mostly on the proliferations that have villi, partial moles, and hydatidiform moles. Uh, and, and I'm gonna uh, not talk about the intermediate type trophoblast tumors, PSTP and ETP uh, today. Um, there, there are some, some risk factors for these tumors, um, and they're best studied in hydrochidiform wall. Um, almost all of them have some biological basis, uh, particularly for maternal age, particularly for greater than 40 years of age. And that's based on their biology, um, the fact that um, oocytes are arrested in meiosis to beginning in fetal life and don't complete that division until after fertilization. And the longer they're in that, that state, the more likely it is that an error will occur. So after 40, the chance of a complete mole becomes quite high. Uh, another factor is race and, race and ethnicity. Um, the highest frequency of an incidence of Complete moles occur in Asia, particularly in Indonesian women, uh, to a lesser extent, Japan. And then when you go to uh, European populations and populations in the US, the incidence is much, much lower. And interestingly, Asian women who come to the US still have a higher risk, indicating that, that there's a strong genetic component. It's just not purely one's environment. Although um, environment certainly plays a, a, a role. Having a prior molar pregnancy is also uh, an increased risk, especially if you had more than one, and we'll point out what the biological basis for this in, in a bit. Uh, Nulliparity and low socioeconomic status, again, suggesting that environment has some contribution. So before I start talking about uh, the uh, molar pregnancies, those based with villi. I want to talk a little bit about choriocarcinoma because it's, in, in some ways, I think of it as the foundation for trophoblastic neoplasia. So, and, and it helps to start with a little bit of clinical context um, for why I want to start here. Uh, first of all, most choriocarcinomas arise from molar pregnancies, and, and by far and away, they arise after complete moles. Um, on the flip side, only one in 40 molar pregnancies will develop into uh, choriocarcinoma or, or have manifestations of choriocarcinoma. 
And it's because of this fluidity between Waller pregnancy and courier carcinoma. In, in a historical legacy, this is referred to as gestational triple blastic disease um, because of this, this um, interchange between the two. Molar pregnancies can also arise, or courier carcinoma can also arise from spontaneous abortions and ectopic gestations. And even uh, about a quarter of uh, these uh, proliferations arise from normal pregnancies. And, and this is uh, an example of here's a normal term pregnancy and courier carcinoma arising within that. The interval can be relatively short, but there are case reports of, of it being many, many years. So it's a, a, a long latency, but most often it comes to light in a concurrent or nearly concurrent pregnancy in intraplacental choreocarcinoma. And, and as I said, this is an example uh, to the left. Uh, what are we looking for? Uh, well, this is a relatively straightforward thing that, that I'm sure you studied many times in the past, but just to refresh your memories, we're, the gross things that we're all hunting for are hemorrhagic nodules. And the reason I point this out is that we want to consider the possibility of it, these proliferations being in the blood clot and that we should sample that, particularly at the periphery. Ordinarily, you know, blood clot is something we, we overlook pretty quickly. Um, the histological features are are the basis for being a foundation. They're biphasic tumors. They're all GATA3 positive and all cytokeratin positive. Um, and they're uh, composed of cytotrophoblasts or, or intermediate type trophoblasts, mononuclear trophoblasts and syncytial trophoblasts. The latter being strongly positive for beta HCG and, and weakly positive for HPL. Uh, one important caveat is that some uh, choreocarcinomas may have a relative paucity of syncytial trophoblasts, particularly following chemotherapy, and you know, hemorrhage and necrosis may predominate, and that goes back to ties in with the gross appearance. And um, most importantly, um, these tumors are diploid, and when they arise from uh, complete hydrogen walls, they're diandric, meaning that they're, they're, the two haploid genomes are both from paternal origin. And as we'll, we'll learn, the parent of origin is a, a, an important genetic factor. Uh, the diagnosis is made by, by recognizing these features. And again, um, oh, this is the same material. Um, the, the mononuclear cells and some tissue trophoblasts in, in some um, proportion. And occasionally the, the hemorrhagic necrosis will predominate. And as I pointed out before, um, choriocarcinoma can arise as an, it's like an in situ neoplasm out of normal placentas. Uh, and in normal placentas, they often, when they're small lesions before they become hemorrhagic, they'll present as small white white masses that resemble placental infarcts. Uh, this is another example where you can see the choriocarcinoma's proliferation uh, uh, associated with a rather uh, abnormal appearing uh, bill structure with the odd proliferation of, of vessels. The, the diff there is a differential diagnosis that we always have to think about. Um, first, is pre villus trophoblasts in really early gestations. Uh, early on, the early gestations can look very mole-like, indicating that there's a, a, a lot of overlap in, in their phenotypes. The other, another possibility to consider when you have courier carcinoma is that it's really a part of a larger gestational trophoblastic disease process in which there had been complete a complete mall in the beginning and that you that we're picking up because there's no villi due to sampling that we're looking at residual molar implantation site and uh, the good news is that it doesn't really matter whether you call it choriocarcinoma gestational trophoblastic disease or whether you do or don't find the uh, 
the villi, the, our choice of terminology doesn't really have any clinical impact. They treat the patients the same. Uh, the last possibility uh, to always keep in mind is that we look at, that you're looking at trophoblastic uh, tumors, PSTTs or ETTs, that 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 we have trouble confusing since we should trophoblast poor choriocarcinomas and and tumors of the implantation site. So here's an example. This is an ectopic pregnancy from uh, near the end of the tube that had a lot of hemorrhage. It was hematocalpins associated with it. And you can see the gestational, uh, the shell of trifoblast with this hemorrhage in it. And it, it looks pretty atypical at this point. Uh, and just off field, there was the, the normal villi or the, the plique. So, so with that as our foundation, let me change gears and switch to talking about complete hydrotidiform wall, which is throughout, I may abbreviate as CHM. Okay. So genetics is really key to understanding these tumors. As I said, they're all diandric proliferations, and I'll use this nomenclature with uh, or variations on it, where P denotes the the paternal genome and M denotes M denotes the maternal genome. So these are proliferations in which there's two pat paternal haploid genomes. Uh, how do you get to this uh, state? Well, uh, in a normal gestation, there's the maternal haploid genome and in the oocyte, and the paternal genome is supplied by a single sperm. Uh, in partial moles, as we'll see later, uh, one possibility is, is that two Sperms fertilize the same oocyte, uh, and related to that possibility is that uh, one sperm fertilizes, and then because of a mistake in the meiosis machinery, it's inadvertently uh, duplicated, um, and that that can happen in both partial moles and in complete moles. So in that model, the single sperm comes in, the maternal haploid genome is kicked out, and this is. Uh, genome is duplicated, so you have two paternal genomes. And one uh, consequence of that is that they'll both be this, have the same sex chromosome, and it's almost a, it's it's exclusively X. And when you look at SNP markers or study uh, loss of heterozygosity on a genome-wide scale, uh, it should be the same uh, LOH or same allele throughout all the markers that you interrogate. The, the other possibility is that two sperms are, are, are put into the oocyte, and again, the maternal genome is kicked out. Here, it may be either XX or XY, uh, but there'll be genome-wide heterozygosity. Uh, of these two possibilities for complete mole, um, the endoreduplication mechanism uh, is per um, more frequent and it accounts for about 80% of the cases. There is a, a rare instance uh, where women come back and have moles in subsequent gestation. That's the, the repeat offenders, if you will. And these turn out to be uh, biparental um, complete moles. What does that mean? Well, they're still diploid, uh, but when you look at their their haploid genomes, there's one maternal genome and one paternal genome. The same as every other normal cell after fertilization ought to be. So what happened? Well, these, as I said, these have been studied with great interest because they are recurrent. And not only are recurrent, but they do, the these women in, uh, families uh, demonstrate an autosomal inheritance, and it seems to have a, or it has a maternal effect, and the biological basis for that is that uh, women have a failure to establish a maternal imprinting. Uh, imprinting is the phenomenon where the expression of genes is silenced uh, in a particular pattern. You can think of X chromosome inactivation later in embryonic life is an example of, of a 
one of these silencing type um, functions. And we're going to look at a, a locus that has a, a imprinting that has different patterns of you know, whether the haploid genome is uh, uh, inherited from mother or father, and it's the maternal imprint that's important or maternal silencing. And th this, these uh, kindreds have, have been studied uh, such that two transacting genes have been identified, one a bit more carefully than the others, and that's NLP7, NALP7, uh, which resides on chromosome 19. It's a negative regulator of interleukin-1 beta, uh, which has been suggested to regulate inflammation that's required for blastocyst implantation. And how that ends up with uh, a failure to establish the maternal imprinting isn't entirely clear, at least to me, uh, but it does. Uh, another uh, gene that's been implicated is an open reading frame on chromosome 6. Uh, and it's also got the embryonic stem cell associated with transcript one. Uh, it's strongly expressed in oocytes, uh, and given that expression, it seems plausible it's in the right place and in the right expressed at the right time to play an important role in sorting out meiosis. So uh, it, it, it's an, uh, a good candidate gene to explain it. Quite how it works is still not understood. Well, this is the classic look of a uh, complete hydatidiform mole uh, that's based in hit history and, and for which it was named, where there's these apparent water drops, the hystasia, um, and forming a false conception, which is. Uh, Mole is the Latin for false conception. And in this example, it's often the case you can see a really hemorrhagic background. Uh, this sort of uh, picture is produced when you float your specimens in saline, and, and they're much easier to see. In a complete mole, embryonic development doesn't occur. It's Development is highly skewed to the placenta to the point where the, the fetus never develops. Uh, the histological features that we're, we're looking for, uh, to, to first approximation, you can think about it as choriocarcinoma with villi. Uh, there's trophoblast atypia, usually. And some of you might think, well, I think all trophoblasts look, look atypical. And yes, that's true, but these trophoblasts usually look even more atypical as uh, Dave Janess, the pathologist who taught me uh, placental pathology, uh, it, they're two standard deviations more atypical than your average trophoblast. Uh, there's circumferential trophoblast hyperplasia, uh, proliferation that's unregulated with, with in, in a spatial sense. Uh, there's molar implantation site, and I'll illustrate that, but think atypia, again, the triphalets look, look atypical. And these features uh, evolve over time. They start off, uh, the villi start off with a mixoid stroma, very similar to what we see in really, really early uh, normal gestations. But the villi have a, a unusual morphologies. They have normal cleft-like invaginations, and there's a progressive stromal cell death and degeneration. And the blood vessels that may be there present very early degenerate. And with this degeneration, the villi cavitate and swell up. They lose their ability to regulate their volume and water. And that's the cause for their swelling. So this is a classic uh, complete mole by histology. There's uh, a, a, this huge cavitation where the the contents are completely degenerating and filled with this pro, uh, protein-rich fluid and an absence of fetal blood vessels. There's the trophoblast hyperplasia, which is a circumferential and often in exuberant, but not always. I'll show you a, a few examples where that's pretty minimal. 
And complete moles are distinct, distinct from the normal progression of proliferation to differentiation in normal uh, gestation. This is uh, an early uh, elective termination. Uh, you can see a, a villi that has po this polarized proliferation. The, the mapier is T67, T so you can see where the proliferation is. And at the tip of these, uh, there's, um, they be leave so the cell cycle and terminally differentiate, partly by expressing a cell adhesion molecule, a CD146 or Melpan, which is also expressed in smooth muscle in the myometrium in the vascular wall. And that's how they do their invasion. Uh, complete moles have trophoblast atypia, uh, which can, as I said, is often much more extreme than uh, typical trophoblast atypia, but it can range uh, quite a bit from, from rather modest to, to severe. So be on the lookout for cases of complete mole, which aren't quite as atypical. Uh, this is an example of molar implantation site. Uh, it's, um, it's distinctive once you have a feel for what you're looking for. It's easy to see and, and because it's more atypical uh, than usual. And one uh, operational way to think about that is if you can see it at much lower magnification, 4x or, or 10x, you can spot implantation site um, really quite easily uh, and it stands out. Think, think about the possibility that you're looking at a com early complete mole. And that actually may be your first clue. Um, Again, there, there's the pitfall that you may be looking at choriocarcinoma or PSTT um, because of, so you need to consider the possibility and look for other walls. So here, here's a, another example of, um, of a cavitating villi. In this case, it's, the shape isn't quite as, as uh, complex, it's a little bit rounder. And there's perhaps less atypia. There's some trophoblast proliferation. Uh, and it's cases like this where you have to make sure that you're not confusing it with a non molar hydropic villi, uh, a hydropic abortus. So this brings me to the concept of, of early complete mole, which uh, was first described by Ray Redline and his colleagues. Um, and when I talk about this, explaining it to people who've never thought about it before um, is you're you're looking for it depends on your your worldview uh, either popcorn or toes or cauliflower uh, what what do I mean uh, you're looking for villi which have these very deep clefts that that look like toes or look like popcorn the first clue that you might have that this is the case is, is that when you notice a, a bluer and more mixoid stroma, but you must be careful because this is, stroma is also very frequent in very early just normal gestations. Uh, this is a little bit clever magnification to, to emphasize the deep clefts and there are these infoldings that that occur one right next to each other in, a, in the normal trophoblast layer. Um, in this case, it actually has kind of a mixture of the early complete mole and the classical complete mole look at cavitating villus here, and uh, uh, some toe like arrangements with blue mixoid or blue or mixoid stroma here. So, depending on kind of the timing of it, uh, you might have some of these features. And with the advent of ultrasound, we see these cases earlier and earlier over the decades and now we almost exclusively see them on the early side. It all begins with with uh, stromal and vascular cell degeneration. Um, the pitfall here is you don't want to overclaw uh, a missed abortion which may also have a similar degeneration early on. And as it undergoes the degeneration you start to get the cavitation. Um, and as I mentioned, this look is much more frequently found in intensively uh, ultrasound screen patients. 
so it would be much more common in the United States compared to the developing to other developing countries. So what's your differential diagnosis for complete mole? Well, uh, the most common one that we see is very early gestational sac, and, and I'll going to illustrate a couple of the cases. That's by far and away the most common consult that gets sent to us. Um, other possibilities include an early uh, abortus or a hydropic abortus. Uh, partial mole is also a diagnostic consideration. And I think the really tricky one is twin gestation with a complete mole as a co twin. So here's an example of early gestational sac. This is a beautiful picture from my colleague, uh, Theone Boyd, where you can see the, the whole thing the tropoblastic shell around the outside edge, uh, the stalk with the amniotic sac and the yolk sac and the, the uh, embryonic disc in between. Uh, this is the whole the whole thing. Um, it's easily recognized when you have the, the embryo, but that's actually quite uh, quite uncommon. Usually, um, this is what people see, and they see the 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 chorionic cyst or the chorionic plate forming this empty cyst and some club-like villa around it, plus or minus some degeneration, uh, but no embryo. And the clue is there's never more than a single quote unquote cavitated villa. So if if you see that and you see the triple uh, the the primary villa radiating out around the the, the lesion, then think about that possibility. Uh, hydropic uh, bordices and early gestational sacs, uh, or early gestations, um, also come into consideration. And the trick to recognizing them is to see this symmetric swelling with attenuation, like like a balloon. The larger they get, the more swollen these villi get as they undergo degeneration than their own pattern of degeneration the thinner the trophoblast layer will get. But there's no proliferation to keep up with their increase in size. And they they rarely, if ever, truly cavitate. There's always those strands of, of actual stroma separating them and no significant accumulations of fluid. It's more evenly dispersed. And so when you have that. Uh, just to, for completeness, let me mention a, a related concept, which becomes a diagnostic problem from time to time, and that's invasive complete moles, uh, which were once known as choriognoma destruens. And one way to think about these is that they're really uh, uh, the cross between a complete mole and placenta accreta. Uh, the, their biological basis isn't really truly understood, but but for operational purposes, they, they do seem like they're complete moles, which have an invasive or, or penetrating quality to them. Why are these a, a clinical problem? Well, most importantly, they're not readily detectable by, by curatage. Um, they're more frequent when the age is over 40 and in underdeveloped countries, but that's also true of complete mole in general. And hemorrhage may uh, obscure the villi grossly. Um, and so these conspire to, to make sampling a, a bit more challenging. Uh, also, for clinical management pur purposes, these have vascular space invasion that's, that's quite common. And with that, they have the possibility of persistent and metastatic to gestational trophoblastic disease. Uh, when you think about cases, the, the whole, the totality of persistent or, and particularly metastatic gestational trophoblastic disease, by far and away the most frequent basis for it is complete mole. The, the second most frequent is invasive mole, and then a little further down the list is choriocarcinoma. 
So keep in mind that Bill I um, may be scarce. And if you have any clever ideas to explain why they're, they're more invasive, I'd love to hear them. The other diagnostic possibility uh, to keep in mind is complete moles in a twin gestation. And this is an example of, of sort of the Murphy's Law. Uh, here's a, a, a early third trimester placenta. Uh, the normal co-twin is over here. We're looking at it from the maternal surface, the placenta from the maternal surface and in cross section. And you can see the, the the delineation between the normal placenta and the molar co-twins placenta. And it has the typical swollen villi. Uh, it's easy to recognize when you have the whole thing like this. Um, but there's some things to keep in mind about this. First of all, it's rare, so we don't think about it when it does come up. Um, um, and most of these are when there's a molar co-twin, most of the time and of greater interest in, in clinical import are when a complete moles, but partial molar co-twins are, are also positive. The, the real pitfall is that, that there can be iatrogenic mixtures of complete mole as the co-twin um, with the normal villi in a curatage specimen and when you mix the two together, you have big villi, small villi, and as we'll see, that's a phenotype that we ordinarily think of as partial moles. So they may, may be mistaken as partial moles and not, not treated appropriately. Uh, clinical consideration is, is that the presence of a normal co-twin often delays diagnosis. Uh, they have very high pre-evacuation HCG, but it's not always clear. Is it because it's a twin gestation or uh, is it because it's molar and the clinical symptoms are, are in accord with the high HCGs? And it poses a real obstetrical management issues, but uh, more and more these are have been managed uh, because you want to risk the balance the risk of uh, bringing a the normal pregnancy to term or to, to delivery and then in treating mom uh, but the OBs can can do it uh, and we've seen a few successful cases it's the one I showed you so we do have some ancillary tools uh, to help and we'll talk a little bit more about how to apply them uh, but the first thing is it's all about exploiting the the genetics um, Many years ago, the, the principal tool was flow cytometry for DNA index, and they would either be uh, 2N or 4N uh, tetrapoid um, in the corresponding DNA index. Um, with time the, and penetration of karyotyping, uh, these have normal karyotypes, so that doesn't always advance the cause very much. Uh, microarrays are now much more frequently used, and, and I imagine within time these will be the frontline tool supplanting karyotyping. Uh, and it's important to appreciate because um, many microarrays are based on SNP, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, and their analysis may detect genome wide LOH in the uniparental type of moles if, it's, if these moles are derived from a single sperm. Uh, the same is true if microsatellite polymorphism analysis is performed. Uh, this is probably more often done in a, in a research context. Uh, some laboratories do it for clinical purposes. Uh, I'll say ours does not as a matter of routine. But if one does it, um, particularly if one has the parental DNAs, one can detect diandry. The, the presence of two paternal haploids without a maternal genome. But the real tool uh, and, the, and the practical tool is immunohistochemistry, and that leverages the, the underlying pathobiology of aberrant imprinting. Um, so what's the basis? Uh, it, it really focuses on cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitor 1C, um, otherwise known as P57. Uh, this is a gene that's Located in a, a, a locus on chromosome 11, 
with IGF-2 and H19. That's it's an imprinted region and it appears to play a pivotal role in the pathobiology of these tumors. Um, it's a strong inhibitor of several cyclin uh, CDK complices and a negative regulator of cell proliferation. Uh, and thus it's a tumor suppressor candidate. And, and it also comes in, its biology also comes into to play in Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and the tumors that develop from Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Uh, so this is the gene that, that we focus on, uh, both because it's useful and because it's, it appears to be integral to the, the pathobiology. So in most uh, cases, it's expressed from the maternal genome, not from the paternal genome. So when you look at villi, it would be expressed in all of the trophoblasts. In, in complete mold, because there's no maternal genome, it's not expressed, it's silenced from the paternal genome. So there's an absence of expression. And, and, and this, this loss or, or failure to express is what is the positive finding. Uh, it's good to realize that there, there is a, um, a, a, an internal control that you can use as proof that your staining worked. Uh, and that takes advantage of a, of a relaxation of imprinting and extravillous trophoblasts. So as the trophoblasts grow away from the little structure, the, the silencing in the paternal genome is relaxed, it's lifted, and it's expressed. Uh, it's also expressed in met normal maternal deciduous cells. So if those are also present, it's also a useful positive control. So finding uh, the cells expression in, in extravillous trophoblasts shows a staining work and its absence in cytotrophoblasts, particularly and in stromal cells in, in uh, villi with the right morphology uh, leads you to support the diagnosis of complete mole. Okay. And, and as I said, the whole biological basis for this is, is mistakes made in, in reproduction. And it's really an example of Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. It's just a question of how often. And so you have to watch out for some unusual uh, P57 staining patterns. And I've, and I've alluded to one, and I'm going to try to do something a little bit different here. Um, we'll do a little bit of annotation. Um, here's here's a little sample. They have two different sides to lie. Uh, and the P57, when you do the staining, um, you see that they're staining in the cytotrophoblasts and then the stromal cells in the small villi, but not in the large villi. And the basis for that is, or the explanation for that is, let's see if I can get the animation to work. I don't know. Oh, my screen is frozen. I am going to Oh my, my screen froze. Oh, it's not moving? Well, I can, um, let's just try this. I can't ad advance my... Uh, oh, there uh, we go. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay. uh, twin, uh, tw twin with complete hydrogenoform mole is a molar uh, co-twin. So the normal villi from, from the normal gestation are small and they have retained expression, but the abnormal large villi uh, lack expression. There, there is uh, a couple of other staining patterns. Uh, there's, there's two different variations on this. I'm gonna try the annotation one more time. We'll chalk talk. Um, 
there's there's one of two possibilities. Uh, one pattern is that you have staining in the cytotrophoblast, uh, and it doesn't have to be every single trophoblast uh, when we're looking for it, but it's it's the the vet, the preponderance. Uh, there may be single trophoblasts that drop out, and in complete walls you'll get spurious or single cell stain here and there. Uh, it's not a 100% phenomenon. It's, it can be close to 100% uh, quite often, but it's not always. So one one combination of stainings, you have a typical villi where the cytotrophoblast stain, but not the villistro, uh, but not the villistrophoblast. The other possibility is is the converse, the stromal cell stain with p57 and uh, cytotrophoblast down stain, and uh, the the biological basis for that is, is uh, well, this pattern has been found by um, Dr. Ronette and her colleagues at the Johns Hopkins and Ray Redline's group and has also talked about it. Um, the explanation for this is, is complicated. Uh, some of these gestations may be chimeric gestations uh, where there's two gestations that were basically squished together. Uh, sort of a, a really weird variation on the on twins, except the, the twins are integrated into the same uh, placenta. Another possibility is that there's mosaicism, and we know mosaicism happens in the placenta, and there's confined placental mosaic in a, quite a, a large number of them. Uh, Dr. Ronette has found uh, that these some of these behave like complete moles, and, but others have found that same phenomenon in partial mole mimics placental mesenchymal dysplasia and Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. So in the end, what do you do? If you see one of these weird variants, my suggestion is to say it's a, it's a molar proliferation. Don't try to further classify it, but suggest that they follow it as if it was a complete mole and and let the, the clinical follow-up dictate the, the management. Okay. So let me switch gears really quickly and talk about partial mole. Um, this one's a little bit harder to pick up grossly. It's a little harder to see the swollen villi. There, there's fewer of them. They're intermixed with, with more tissue often. They may be associated with a mal maldeveloped fetus. Uh, here's, here's a molar um, placenta. You can see some swollen villi. They're often abnormal. The key and most consistent finding <coughs> is syndactyly, particularly pre four syndactyly. Uh, one of the developmental dysmorphologists that I work with, uh, his, he always says the differential for pre four syndactyly is is partial mole, partial mole, and partial mole. Uh, very, very few other things have have syndactyly in such a consistent fashion, particularly in three, four in the hand. The distinction from complete mole is, is that it, first it has a it's a biphasic uh, population by size, and uh, let's see if I can clear all the drawings. Um, biphasic distribution in size. And one uh, really rather stringent threshold for villus enlargement is that it has to be greater than uh, 2.5 millimeters. Now, this is, it gives a, a re, it's a very reliable thing. If you see this dimorphism with villi that large, you, it's quite likely you're looking at a partial mole, but you're going to miss a lot of moles if you just rely on that single criteria. Another category, another criteria to look for, and particularly what I think about this time of year is Caribbean island shapes, really complex scallop shapes. Oops. So uh, partial moles have, have rather complex shapes, high fractal number um, with a lot of coves. And one reflection of that shape is that there's deep invaginations. And depending on what angle you look at it, you'll see uh, Inclusions. Now, uh, this this is a strange property. Some some complete mole or partial moles have it very frequently. Others rarely do it. They they have the odd shape, but not the deep invaginations. 
uh, but when it's there, it's it's a helpful clue and it re reflects the, the shape complexity. It's not proof that it's a partial wall, but it's it's helpful. Uh, my favorite criteria is the presence of at least a few scattered, cavitated, larger villi. Um, and earlier in my career, I tried to make the diagnosis of partial wall quite frequently. We would then get the, the flow cytometry back and find that it was diploid and with the aneuploid peak and realize that I was trying to overcall. So I, I tend not to call partial wall unless I see cavitated villi. So you put those two. Uh, um, parameters together, the large biphasic, biphasic population with large, very large villi and cavitation, uh, that's quite good. Uh, there's also trophoblastic proliferation, but it, it's maybe not the kind of proliferation that uh, hyperplasia normally invokes. It's, it's proliferation just enough to keep up with the, the increasing size and shape complexity. Uh, it doesn't be, the, the skin of the villi doesn't become attenuated and you have a lot of trophoblast heads. Partial moles, unlike complete moles, have, have fetal development. So if you find amnion and chorion or fetal blood, uh, that's also useful. You may find embryonic tissue, that's rather uncommon. And, and it's true that numerous nucleated fetal red blood cells are not typically found in complete mole. That said, I will say that we have seen over the years a few cases of complete mole with a few nucleated red blood cells present. Uh, so it's not an absolute indicator that it's a partial mole, but it's a pretty good. Uh, there are some mimics to be aware of. There's chorionic plate mimicking a cavitated villus, so don't. Don't jump at that. And aneurysms can mimic a partial wall quite well. Uh, here's some dysmorphic villi, uh, size, size variations, odd shapes, no cavitation. Uh, this is tr trisomy 21. Uh, here's a, the most frequent mimic in my experience is trisomy 13, and that's a frequent uh, aneurysm in, in this gestational age range. The best mimic that I've ever seen is trisomy 11. And when you think about it, that makes perfect sense uh, because that's where the P57 locus is. Uh, and if you had three copies from the father, that would be a perfect setup for a partial mole. Uh, uh, so partial moles are diandric triploid gestations and they favor placental growth. The whole point of moles is proliferation of, of trophoblasts at the expense of the fetus. Uh, this is basically the same study that was done by two different groups in two different eras. Uh, Ray Redline's group did it in the late 90s. Um, and they found that um, when you look at, at the total world of, of triploid genomes, about one third are non-molar and two thirds are molar, and they have a spectrum of, of phenotypes, which he called early, ancient, and suggestive in addition to the classic type. Uh, a more modern take on this was from uh, uh, San Francisco and, and Dr. Rabin's group. Uh, in, interestingly, using uh, much more modern uh, technology to doing it, uh, they came up with basically the same number, one third, two thirds, uh, where a third are non-molar um, and they're digynic gestations, have, meaning that they have two matrimonial components, two matrimonial haploid genomes, and whereas the partial moles are two paternal genomes, they're diandric, triploid. Uh, their study was is interesting because when they look carefully, only a quarter by uh, were were diagnostic by having the presence of cis currents and uh, the villus enlargement greater than two and a half millimeters. So if we're really stringent in this uh, diagnostic way, we're missing three quarters 
of our cases because they have focal or incomplete phenotypes. Uh, and the uh, implication of that is if we if we, if we're missing cases, we're they're not, they're not having bad outcomes, so missing them is not necessarily a terrible thing, uh, particularly in the era when these patients were were placed on LCPs and carefully followed with HCG that couldn't get pregnant and delayed fertility. I'll also point out that there are rare examples out there of tetraploid uh, moles and they're they're partial moles because they're triandric. There, there is a maternal component, but only a small maternal component. So this is the triploidy that, that we're often overlooking and not recognizing. This is a non-molar triploidy, and it was digynic uh, to maternal comp complements. Uh, some of them may look kind of funny and have some suggestive features, but by and large, they mostly look rather sclerotic without cavitation, uh, as if the, having the presence of a natural, extra maternal component or excess maternal genome um, favors fetal development at the expense of the placenta. So uh, what, what's the deal with uh, ploidy for partial mole? Is it the solution, a helping hand, or completely unnecessary? Uh, well, if you do it by karyotype, uh, you have to have living cells. If you do it by flow cytometry, you need whole nuclei. If you do it uh, with in situ hybridization, like FISH or SISH, uh, it's inconclusive with just one chromosome because you could be looking at, a, at an aneurysm for that chromosome. So you have to do a bunch of probes. <coughs> a microsatellite. Fingerprinting, like uh, like identity testing type fingerprinting, uh, it's complicated, particularly if you don't have the parental DNAs to, to, as companions for for reference. Uh, the same is true for microarray. It needs it helps with parental DNA, and it also have to have um, a lot more bioinformatics. You have to be thinking about the possibility. Some the chip we use is actually designed for tumors, and and it doesn't even really, you have to look at the raw data if you're thinking, if you want to think about uh, this phenomenon. And I'm sure as we get closer to whole genome and exome sequencing, that, that'll be true too. And it also requires bioinformatics. Uh, they all re require instrumentation, they cost time and money. Uh, you have to consider the parent of origin. And it, it, this may be data that you didn't seek out, somebody else did the test. And, and it may not be on your radar because of that. So do you really need copy number analysis? Well, we went back and did a study of our, our cases looking back retrospectively. Um, I reviewed the diagnosis blinded and my fellow was very cruel and she mixed in a lot of really good mimics. Uh, so under optimal circumstances, and in a refined population, pull out all the normal placentas and so forth. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity is, is okay uh, with histology alone, with histology and ancillary testing. It, it didn't have much of an impact. Um, uh, more importantly, doing um, P57 testing was highly effective. It pulled out, it excluded uh, the, or categorized or segregated all the partial moles from all of the complete moles. So that, that part works really well. And of the 40, 145 subjects we had clinical follow-up, uh, 16 were diagnosed by uh, uh, as having gestational trophoblastic disease, persistent GTD by serum HDG. Uh, we had curtages on 13 of them and um, when you looked at them, they looked more like routine placentas. They were highly sclerotic villi. Uh, and only two had adverse outcomes. One had an ETP-like process and one had choreocarcinoma. So the, the risk of subsequent metastatic trophoblastic disease was, was quite low. Here's what the persistent partial mole looks like. The villi are often funny looking and still retain their odd shapes and and in, in large size, but they're very sclerotic. And, and because of that, it may escape your notice. 
Um, but here's here's one of the exceptions to the rule, and I'll I'll just point out that so this is uh, um, one of my uh, former fellows and organizers of this conference. It's, she did work this case up. It was it truly was a partial mole, and I'll show the data to to back it up. Uh, unfortunately, the original pathologist uh, escaped noticing that there was an intraplacental choriocarcinoma in the same uh, same placenta, and it was left. Here's here's the p16 expressed in all the villus or cytotropoblasts in villus stromal cells. Not P57 was not expressed in the intraplacental choreocarcinoma, and it was a triploid genome. So it truly was a partial mole. It wasn't its funny looking complete mole. Uh, this was what happened subsequently. She had metastatic uh, um, chore, uh, choreocarcinoma in one place and persistent um, mole, the sclerotic villi in the in the uterus when it was subsequently removed. So at this point, you're probably thinking, uh, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Um, and if you've looked at a lot of placentas, it, it, it's, this is what you might see on umbilical cord cross sections if you've looked at too many. So here's my practical approach. Um, absence of villi doesn't exclude molar gestation, but it certainly moves it down the list. Um, if, if you're missing the you have to start thinking about EPP and PSTP, and they're atypical implantation site counterparts. The risk of persist, persistent gestational, gestu, gestational trophoblastic disease, and that's now the clinically defined persistent HCG in serum, which could be due to persistent disease in the uterus or, or recurrence in the clinical sense or metastasis. Um, the, the risk is for metastasis is really high for uh, complete moles, about 20%, where I showed you the, our data for uh, partial mole, probably on the order of 2% for pers persistent HCG but the risk for metastatic disease is quite low, especially even and probably even lower because think of all the partial moles that we're missing if we're just doing standard histology alone and no further ancillary techniques as, as the Rayban and, and Redline groups uh, taught us. So this is what I think we should do. I think our strategy should really focus on finding every complete mole because that's really where the high risk is. So I advocate the use of using P57 liberally. Um, it works well, it's cheap, and it adds very little delay to the time. Uh, if your P57 scanning pattern doesn't make sense, um, ask for help because you may have found one of these odd chimeric and mosa or mosaic gestations with the potential to behave like a complete mole. Plus, for those of us who are interested in these, these are cool cases and we're, we're looking for more of them. Uh, if you have genetic information, use it, um, but think about it more after you exclude a, a complete mole because they're diploid. And so, you know, just because it's diploid, don't, don't say you're done. Uh, it's particularly helpful for, for weeding out the aneurysmes. As I, I showed examples of trisomy 13, I mentioned 11, and I showed another example of 21. Uh, all of the aneurysmes, to some extent, can give you partial mole-like mimics. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is triploidy does not equal partial mole because we have digynic triploidy. But if you have triploidy plus dysmorphic villi, in other words, suggestive histology, I think that's su sufficient for the diagnosis of partial mole, in my opinion particularly in these days where they don't follow the patients as intensively or for as long. Uh, I don't wait for karyotype or microarray in most cases. Uh, the volume's just too high, they take too long. Uh, but I usually add my name to the cytogenetic report distribution and then I check it later or it, it comes up on my list to check. Um, and 
again, when you have a non-canonical P57, it might be a tween or a chimeric, and you can think about those possibilities. Okay. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes very quickly, uh, if you'll bear with me, and uh, maternal and placental uh, SARS infection, um, because it's, I think it's very timely. Uh, this is one of those few things in our careers where we're in the midst of a, a really fast-breaking story. Um, all the information is coming out on non-traditional media. I'm hearing more about these cases, more about the, the science and the news uh than elsewhere and we have social media like 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 what we're on now um and professional uh, professional listeners and word of mouth and it's also been an interesting experience because a lot of the papers came out in in pre-publication uh, meaning not peer-reviewed um cases i just briefly want to make sure we're all on con common ground the the coronavirus is attached to cells and they gain entry by binding to the um to the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 uh, receptor, and they get in. But that's not all that's required for them to get in. They're, once they bind to ACE2, uh, they need a process called priming, which requires another cellular enzyme, uh, a protease, and the predominant one seems to be the serine protease, Tempris 2, which, uh, uh, which some of you know from might know from prostate um, neoplasia. And this protease uh, cleaves the spike protein and then it allows it to, to um, change its configuration and facilitate fusion with the membrane. And that's how it gains entry. So it, it has to have, have both ACE2 and Tempris or, a, a, or another similar protease. So the real question that we all had early on was, is there transmission from mom to baby? And if it does, how often and by what mechanisms? Is it in utero, being transplacental? Is it interpartum by vaginal contact? Or is it postpartum to breast milk? And there, there, there were a lot of stories that, that broke very early on. Uh, the One of the first came from China, uh, where they had a small uh, series. Uh, there were numerous case reports of actual infection. This one from from Yale um, on one of these preprint servers that that described theirs. Uh, I just want to talk about our study. From basically, it was a New England New England New York uh, consortium. We had we scoured our cases very early on. We had 19 COVID exposed moms or COVID positive moms. And we focus more on the pathobiology um, in this series. Uh, we looked for ACE2 in, in the placenta, and we found it uh, expressed in the syncytial trophoblast, and that's what you see in this immunostain. Uh, but to a lesser extent, well, it's also present in cytotrophoblasts and intermediate trophoblasts as well. Um, but it has a very unusual polarized distribution where it's skewed to the basal side. So if there's circulating um, viral particles in mom's blood, it wouldn't necessarily have access to the ACE2 receptor because it's sequestered on the far side of the placenta or on the far side of the trophoblast layer. Uh, not only that, but when we looked for Tempris 2, it was only weakly present in, in the villi and and limited to the villus endothelium. And it was only rarely positive in, um, in this cytotrophoblast. So this combined expression pattern may limit, uh, limit infection. And two out of 19 placenta that we had, and they were cherry picked because they, had, they were positive. That's one of them came from the New York uh, area. Uh, were infected, demonstrating that infection was positive. But we didn't find any specific pathology. But but we've since then we, uh, more cases have been accumulated and they're sprinkled all over the place. This is the case I saw uh, over the last few weeks of a mother and baby in Maine, both were COVID positive. Um, the on the left you see the spike protein by immunohistochemistry, so you can see it 
scattered in the trophoblast. So it looked very, um, very indicative of infection. And on the right, uh, the viral genome, and we've used the probe for the spike protein because it's specific to CoV-2 uh, by in situ hybridization. Uh, this particular placenta and, and these emerging ones have a particular pattern of placentitis. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, various sized clusters of aggregated villi um, and chronic histocytic intervillositis when you look close up at it. Uh, they have macrophages uh, in the intervillous space in high numbers. This is marked by PU1. There's no lymphocytes, so it's not a, an intervillous, it's not a villitis that's spilling out. And if you look at MPO for neutrophils, there's also an acute component, uh, which goes with the, the early placental infarction, uh, trophoblast necrosis, and, and intervillous fibrin deposition pattern. So it's really a, a, an unusual pattern of chronic intervillositis. Uh, so the takeaway message is our placental infections are uncommon in most COVID positive or COVID positive uh, mothers. Uh, the clinical mechanisms um, are emerging, but but not completely understood. We know that maternal viremia is low and that ACE2 is present in the, the cells of the sphincter trophoblast, but they're mostly on the stromal side and campus 2 is very low and that may limit infection. So how did these women get infections? It's not really clear. Uh, one thing, the a possibility is that moms are producing antibodies and antibodies IgG can get shuttled across the placenta. And there is a potential mechanism where viral particles stuck to a IgG, bound to an IgG, could be transported across the placenta and, and as, a, as a shuttle, and that that viral particle might escape destruction and, and be released to infect the baby um, not, or, or the placenta. Uh, not clear if that's the mechanism. Um, an interesting phenomenon that's been proven to be true in CMV infections. The role of, of uh, ancillary testing in the placenta isn't really as well established, but anti spike protein seems to work, although some antibodies are kind of fluky. And here's uh, maybe I watched too much TV, so uh, forgive me. Bolo, be on the lookout for um, the uh, emerging pattern of histopathology. And, and what I think we're really looking for is a, a, a variant or an atypical chronic histocytic intervillositis where there's a more of a mixed inflammatory infiltrate with neutrophils and, and macrophages in the intervillous space. There's necrosis or infarction, particularly of the trophoblast layer that's essentially trophoblast. And there's, and to varying extents, there's um, perigolous fiber deposition. So in the meantime, before we all get vaccinated, wear your mask, keep calm. Uh, I want to thank my uh, colleagues in, at the Brigham and throughout the Harvard system that uh, contributed to these studies. And thank you. Um, the, the sun is coming up, the days will get longer, and, and uh, best wishes for the new year. And thank you so much, Dr. Corey. This was an excellent talk. Uh, I am looking at a few questions online. So let me uh, read one for you. So this one is regarding uh, COVID-19 in placenta. So the question is, uh, how specific are those findings uh, for COVID-19 infection? And are, are they related to other viral infections in the placenta? I'll answer this. Second question first, uh, as far as I'm aware, we haven't seen any um, concurrent viral infections. Uh, so it seems to be a single virus and just the COVID virus. Um, but the experience is very limited at this point. Um, uh, I. I 
think the the it's not like your typical chronic velitis spilling out into the intervillicitis and having a lot of lymphocytes. It's different than the, the that run-of-the-mill chronic velitis. Nor is it like the usual chronic histocytic intervillicitis where it has halos of, of macrophages hanging out in the placenta, but not a lot of villus damage. This is distinct in that there's there's damage to the to the villi that it, I don't know if it's truly an infarct. It sort of mimics early infarcts. The villi aggregate. Um, quite what the basis of that is. I don't know if I don't you know if it's host mediated destruction or viral mediated destruction. Um, but it's it's a sort of a different pattern. Um, we've all been looking at other possibilities, like you know, in the adults. One of the patterns that seems to be important is microvascular uh, thrombosis, and, and we've done a bunch of schemes for cases of uh, stem villus thrombosis and chorionic plate thrombosis. That doesn't seem to be viral. Viruses are present in those, um, and we've stained a lot of chronic velitis and. Um, haven't had any success, or even early infarct-like things. I've seen a bunch of those just to, to see. It's really the combination of these two sort of infarcty villus thrombosis plus a chronic intervillicitis pattern. So um, I think that's going to be the distinctive look. It's a chronic intervillicitis with you know, acute inflammatory cells and trophoblast necrosis. Thank you. There is another related question. So is there any significant difference if the mother is uh, infected early in pregnancy as compared to later in pregnancy? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, and um, too soon to tell, although I will say that in our series, we had a and and even since then, I've seen a lot of placentas where where mom was uh, before uh, or, or exposed earlier in pregnancy, and then comes to term delivery, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of stigmata. I think the basis for that is is sort of what I alluded to. That I think the good news is that I was I had to kind of push this on to my colleagues when we were writing the papers. It, we had to look at it as good news. Uh, babies are protected from infection most of the time because even though they have the re viral receptor, it's not exposed to the maternal blood. So they don't often get infected. Um, uh, so I, I can, can't recall any cases of infection early on during pregnancy and, and where it infected the placenta. Um, but we've certainly seen a large number of cases where mom seems to have been infected early in pregnancy and nothing happened. Um, most of the cases of infection has been active at the time of delivery when there's been pathology. Right, thank you. Uh, one more question uh, related to that. Um, have you, do you have any experience or are you aware of any report on fetal mortality in relation to uh, COVID infection in the mother? Um, not mortality. Uh, some of the fetuses, for example, the, the one I showed you uh, were symptomatic, um, but I'm not aware of any fatalities yet. Okay, uh, just one more the, again. The caveat, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, the caveat to that is, you know, things are still happening, and and you know, the news is it's hard to keep up with the news. So, I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point in the future that would be reported, but it hasn't been reported thus far, and and consequently, I don't think it's it's a high likelihood of that. Uh, one more question in that line here. I can see that uh, 
do you have any experience of doing immunostain for COVID-2 in placenta? Yeah, well, the, the, that's, the, um, that's the immunostain that I showed you. We, and I've stained a lot of placentas. Um, uh, and so far, we, um, and we have the, the same antibodies here and at the MGH and Bruce lab. And we've only uh, stained a, a, or found a, a handful of true infections. So like I said, infection, true placental infection is, is quite uh, uncommon. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I, because of that, I think the antibody works pretty well. Uh, Drew, my Drew Roberts, my counterpart over at the MGH, is is a little more wishy washy about it. Um, when we set up the stains for the for the study for the inside to harmonization, we set it up over there, so she has access, a little more readily access to it. And, and, and Drew thinks about it as screening plus definitive test. I'm a little more bullish on the antibody and I think it's a reasonable uh, tool unless you're maybe thinking about it in more of a research environment. So if you have access to the antibody, if it's, and if it's working well in adult type specimens, I think it's, oh, and you have placentas for which you're concerned that it could just be a, a placental infection, go ahead and stain it. Um, what you're really looking for is that pattern that I showed you where you get little little patches of of syncytial trophoblast staining uh, that gives you this kind of a hit or miss and kind of a, a dash-like pattern. Um, that seems to be the pattern that every when when there's positive staining. So if you're looking at something really wispy and you're kind of is it isn't it? It's probably not. Oh, thank you. There is one question about ACE2 staining. Uh, the question that I see is that, uh, uh, do you have any experience of ACE2 staining uh, in placenta in other situations like other viral infections that you can compare and how it is related to uh, COVID-19? Yeah, that's a, a, a good question. I, we haven't really explored in that direction. Uh, on the other hand, um, my it, my predictions, if one were to do the experiment, um, it probably isn't. You know, all of these viruses have their their different um, different host cell receptor for the virus that, that the virus uses to get in. Um, I think they're all pretty much known, and so far as I know, all of the viral um, things that cause chronic velitis, the torch type viruses, um, they don't use ACE2. So I think that's idiosyncratic to, or, or, or limited to the, the coronaviruses. And it, that was really first established in, in, in CoV-1, the, the original SARS, and a lot of the, the, the groundwork was really laid for that. And so, that's why everyone focused on these two very quickly because arguing by analogy from from the first coronavirus. Uh, one last question, uh, which is unrelated to uh, COVID, uh, it's about molar pregnancy. How do you differentiate hydropic degeneration from hydropic pregnancy? I am not exactly sure what uh, the uh, what it means, but uh, this is how the question is asked. Yeah, um, that well, that really is the key question, isn't it? Is is there a distinction? Um, I, I think it's a, a matter of spectrum. Um, I think the the classic hydropic abortus, where they're all very degenerate, where the villi are in the conceptus are uniformly swollen and with that symmetric attenuated water balloon look um, is at the far end of the spectrum we would 
uh, classically was called the uh, hydropic abortus. Um, I think in our practices now, we don't see that that extreme very often. Uh, you know, OBs are much more proactive. These cases are are managed much earlier. They're they're studied by ultrasound very very early in the degeneration sequence. I think what we I, I most often see patterns where where there's a little bit of villous swelling and villous sclerosis, and that's it's much more of a mixed pattern. These, especially with time, the, the pure hydropic enlargement is relatively uncommon. Um, so much so that I think it's kind of hard to find really good pictures or good slides to, to refresh the teaching collections. Um, it's, it's much more of a mixed bag now. So I, I view it as more of a spectrum and, and, and the hydropic abortus being at the far end of the spectrum. I think uh, that's all I see about questions online. So thank you, Dr. Kode, for this excellent talk on molar pregnancy and especially uh, that uh, breaking news about the COVID-19 related changes in uh, placenta. You would be really happy to hear that you had several hundred viewers who joined from different countries. And I could see the uh, viewers who joined from far off places like Bolivia, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Belgium, Pakistan, Tanzania, Malaysia, uh, to name a few. And of course, there were viewers from US and quite a few viewers from India also joined in. And thanks to our viewers for your support. and. This was our last lecture for the year 2020. And thank you for your support always. And I hope, and we hope at podcast that uh, uh, you, you are being able to learn from all of our excellent speakers. They, they have contributed their time. And as always, uh, please feel free to follow and subscribe our YouTube channel and the Facebook page and subscribe to our newsletter and also visit our website that is pathologicast.com and you can stay updated with all the upcoming lectures and the next lecture that would be the first lecture for the new year it would be our fifth lecture in non-neoplastic lung disease pathology which would be delivered by uh, dr tom kobe and dr kevin leslie that would be on 8th january in the new year so hope to see you then and wish you all a very happy new year and a very happy holiday season. And thank you again, Dr. Kwadev, for your time today. Thanks a lot. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you.